last Marvel movie I've seen was The Avengers, and let's be honest, that was amazing. You know, that was every comic book fan's dream to see all those characters on the big screen. $1.5 billion worldwide, and that's how much money Avengers made. That's one of the most successful films of all time. People love Escape the spider -Man. Marvel is modern myth-making of today. When I was growing up, I was the only guy for probably 500 miles who could tell you that Tony Stark was Iron Man. Now we all know it, and it's great. As recently as two or three years ago, we also lived under the fear that, oh my God, one bad superhero movie is going to happen and the whole Hollywood industry is going to give up and not do it anymore. That's not the case anymore. Now seeing all these movies, it's sort of like a validation for comic books because the superhero now has arrived in movies and they're actually doing it very well. We've built up enough positive momentum, Marvel has built up enough positive momentum where I don't know what's going to stop them. Les super-héros règnent aujourd'hui en maître sur Hollywood et la pop culture. Mais il n'y a pas si longtemps, au milieu des années 90, ils ont bien failli être emportés par la folie spéculative de Wall Street. En première ligne, la société Marvel Entertainment. Maison mère de Spider-Man, Iron Man ou encore Captain America, elle fut déclarée en faillite le 27 décembre 1996 avant d'être miraculeusement sauvée pour mieux renaître de ses cendres. Comics in general, and Marvel was no exception to this, sales were beginning to decline in the 1980s. 1986 was the watershed moment in American comics because that was the year of Watchmen, of The Dark Knight, and of Mouse. These three comics changed everything about what the, the American public thought comic books were. The gritty realism and the fact that The Dark Knight was clearly created for an audience of adults, or at least late adolescents, but it wasn't kiddie stuff. And Marvel at that point was not as quick to grab that, that sort of brass ring that was being offered of salvation. X-Men was always the best-selling comic in the late 1970s and all through the 1980s. Same with Avengers, same with Spider-Man. These were still the top-selling comics in America, but every year, they would drop another five or 10,000 copies per, you know, per year in sales, uh, and prices escalated to try to make up the difference. So it's an exaggeration to say it was in free fall. It's, that's not the case, but there was a slide. Well, in order to sell more, we'll do an alternate cover. So there'll be three covers and a retail will order more, or we'll do a shiny cover, or we'll do something made out of, uh, I don't know, uranium. I don't know. You know, we just put anything on the book that we can maybe get the book to sell more and it started relying on gimmicks. And when you rely on gimmicks, you start losing the soul of the work. They began trading comics as collectibles, less so than enjoyable, readable periodicals. People were buying cases of Spider-Man number one by Todd McFarlane as a special collectible. They were buying a hundred of these because they thought that someday, years down the road, they'd be able to put their kids through college based on the investment they were making. They treated them as investable collectibles. They treated them as bonds and stocks. But they're not. They're stories. Pilier de la culture américaine depuis les années 40, omniprésente dans les années 60, Marvel capitalise sur ses succès et profite de l'appétit des acheteurs pour augmenter ses tarifs. De 40 cents en 1980, le prix minimum de ses comics grimpe à 1 dollar en 1988. Cette fièvre des collectionneurs attire l'attention du milieu des affaires. En 1989, Ronald Perelman, poids lourd de Wall Street, rachète Marvel pour plus de 82 millions de dollars. Très vite, il met en place un système complexe de holdings, relié à son propre conglomérat, McAndrews and Forbes. En 1991, Perelman introduit Marvel en bourse et l'entraîne dans une spirale d'acquisition. 
à Wall Street, le cours de Marvel s'envole. Les super-héros entrent dans le monde de la haute finance. Mr. Perlman is extremely intelligent, a very good investor, who over a period of years had put together what I would call an empire. Uh, also a, a man who is not particularly fond of publicity, uh, but runs a very tight ship. He's in control. He analyzes businesses. He looks for growth opportunities. And Marvel was just one part of the empire. Most of the presidents of Marvel weren't interested in comic books. They weren't comic book fanboys. They were just people who were trying to manipulate the stock and, and ownership and what have you. Uh, I had very little to do with Ron Perlman. He had a townhouse and his own entourage, and he did not come down to Marvel. The uh, higher executives like the presidents came to him, and he had no input into the day-to-day -day comic books or storylines or characters, any of that. He could have cured less. The famous story is that Perlman bought Marvel assuming that Superman was part of the deal and only finding out afterwards that, oh, by the way, he's another company. They didn't know what they were buying. They just knew that this was a potential profit center for them. And I don't think it really sank in on me at the time, the impact that Ron Perlman buying Marvel Comics had and was going to have. At that point, it just seemed like, oh, well, at least there's some money in the coffers. At least somebody's taking care of the company. But I and many of my fellow freelancers sort of saw as the months and the years went on that suddenly major Wall Street corporations and major money players were treating the companies the same way we treated the comics in the 1990s as collectibles. The idea that they weren't buying these companies because they wanted good comics to come out. They even cared about the characters. The comic book editors that reported to me Really, I allowed them to think that we were in the business of publishing comic books, but we were really in the business of intellectual properties. And the idea was that to publish the comic books, you kept the characters alive, the 5,000 or so Marvel characters, and you kept the copyrights and trademarks alive, and you kept them in front of the public so that we could sell lunch boxes and bed sheets and movies and TV shows. That's where the big money was. Well, there's the dire situation from the financial point of view. The business plan had been for Marvel to continue to buy companies like Panini. Uh, cash flow, um, no growth. So we bought a whole series of companies that had cash flow and no growth. And um, we convinced Wall Street that buying flat companies was the same thing as growth. There was approximately $500 million dollars of bank debt made up of a revolving credit facility and a term loan. And then there must have been uh, something in the area of a million dollars of trade debt and other debt, maybe more. But the, the bank debt uh, was secured. They had liens on essentially all of the assets of entertainment and entertainment subsidiaries including the foreign companies, Panini. So the bank group basically had liens on all of the operating assets. As we started to have to pay off the interest and we felt pressure to make more and more money, we started to make really stupid business decisions. So we re released more and more different titles and we would raise the price point and things would look good for the first month that we would do it, but in the long haul we created this really horrible downward cycle where we were pricing new customers out of the business and we were doing so many different books that the storylines got so complex that no new readers could come in. So basically we slammed the door on new readers. The challenge was to look surprised when the circulation numbers dropped, but I, I, I couldn't look surprised. So the first exodus for me was like the first exodus for a lot of people. We saw that the company was going to go bankrupt. We did our best to be vocal about what to do to fix it, and we did our best to fix it, but when it was clear that that wasn't going to happen, you know, most of the better people left. We couldn't even fathom the idea that Marvel Comics could go out of business. How, how is that possible? Look at all the books. They're all over the world. They're printed in every language. You know, like most creative people, we, we were just worried about making good books, so we figured somebody else is taking care of that. You have to understand that 
at Marvel, you had two levels. You had the suits and you had the creators. And the suits were the people running the business and the creators were the people creating the comic books. The people creating the comic books lived in a false euphoria, if you will. They thought everything was fine, the comic books were coming out, the stories were good, everybody was having a good time. The suits upstairs are wheeling and dealing and you know, fighting for financing and ownership and control and, and all kind of Machiavellian plots. During 1996, as things got increasingly worse, there were defaults under the bank agreements. So there were negotiations with the banks for waivers of those defaults. And agreements were reached with the banks to waive the defaults for a period of time. And the hope was that before the end of the year, the economy would come back, consumer spending would increase, and they could reinstate everything. As the year progressed, there seemed to be no real hope that that was going to happen. So the decision was reaching an agreement with the bank group as to a restructuring. Uh, and that would be part of what we call a prearranged Chapter 11. And then there was the news of Chapter 11, and we were just like, well, what, what does that mean? Le chapitre 11 de la loi américaine sur les faillites est l'équivalent du redressement judiciaire français. Il permet à une entreprise surendettée d'obtenir d'un juge le gel de ses créances, le temps de proposer un plan de restructuration pour sortir du rouge. Ron Perelman et ses conseillers espèrent ainsi gagner du temps vis-à-vis -vis des banques, tandis que Marvel entraîne le marché des comics dans sa chute. Yeah, the 90s were a funny time. Like, I was trying to break into the comics industry just when it was collapsing. It's like trying to get into international banking in 2009. You know, it's like everything had completely fallen apart. Everyone was losing their jobs. Comics was in chaos, and I was coming in at this time as a young guy so, uh, trying to get jobs, and uh, there was just nothing going at all. And Marvel, which used to be the ultimate aspiration of anyone working in comics, was a ghetto. Like, nobody wanted to work there. I mean, there was even stories of people, writers and artists, were being sued. This was rumours, you know, uh, by uh, people that Marvel owed money to. Like, because they couldn't get the money out of Marvel, they were coming after the writers and artists and sending them those lawyers' letters trying to get cash. So people were getting hit with massive bills. The, the place was insane, it was, it was nuts. So it's not as if it was a secret that things were heating up at Marvel, that things were dire there. Uh, and we get stories in about there's suddenly there's no coffee maker in the office because they thought coffee would be too expensive. Or suddenly the FedEx uh, account had been canceled because they decided that the, it was too expensive to have a Federal Express account. Another thing was they sold the two doors to their conference room because the doors had pictures of Spider-Man on it and they managed to find a buyer for their doors. And I don't know the validity of these stories, but stories that this were circulating and freelancers were like, you know, how on earth can we work for people who can't even afford to make coffee anymore? <laughs> Half of the people went, well, I better go get work at DC, you know. We just hear things. We'd say, well, you know, even if it goes chapter 11, it's still going to be in business. That's just some technical thing they have to do. We didn't understand it, you know, because we're, we're, all we thought was, uh, well, I need to get the next issue out by Thursday. That's not really my problem. I need to do this, you know. So we thought, well, they'll figure it out. These guys know what they're doing. Ron Perlman would come to Marvel about once a year with his daughter on Bring Your Daughter to Work Day and say to his daughter, Daddy owns all of this, and then he would go away. He was busy owning Revlon and Coleman and uh, I think Hummer and all kind of companies, and basically using one company to leverage the other company, which is what got him into trouble with Marvel. Uh, because what Ron Perlman didn't realize is that there was a bigger shark than him swimming in the waters named Carl Icahn. Who is Mr. Icon? There are various descriptions of Mr. Icon. And back in the 90s and the 80s, uh, Mr. Icon was probably known as a green mailer, that he would take a position, urge changes in the company, uh, and to basically get rid of him, he would be paid green mail. So if he took a 10% or 13% or 14% interest in an entity, the entity would pay him a premium over the market value of that stock to go away and stop bothering them. And he was very successful at it. What precipitated his interest is very speculative. 
My own guess is that he read the disclosure, proposed disclosure statement, noticed that uh, Mr. Perlman, through his companies, was going to infuse another $365 million, and probably came to the conclusion that if Mr. Perlman was going to put in that kind of money, there must be something here that he knows about that nobody else knows about, and it might be worth his investment. So he became active in the Chapter 11 case. Now there is an even more supreme struggle for the fate of Marvel, but it is like for us, it is as if we were watching Galactus and the Silver Surfer slug it out above our heads in the skies above, and we are just ordinary mortals. That is the scale at which the battle is going on. We have no control over it, but we want to see what's happening next because our jobs and livelihoods depend on it. Entre les titans Ron Perelman et Carl Icahn, la guerre pour le contrôle de Marvel est déclarée. Au fil des mois, Icahn a racheté le tiers de la dette du groupe. S'il obtient plus de 50% du capital de Marvel Entertainment, il pourra imposer son propre conseil d'administration. Il ignore qu'en coulisses, un outsider s'apprête à entrer dans l'arène. Toy Biz, la filiale jouet de Marvel, dirigée par le financier Ike Perlmutter et son responsable créatif, Avi Arad. I was always a storyteller. I find that it made life easier. Developing toys is very much like developing a show or a movie. To tell a story, you have to find a reason why would someone want to play with it. When we started talking about toy biz, that I believe initially bought it for liquidation, just to take it apart and sell it in pieces. And then I noticed that he has rights for Marvel. Wait a second. This little company have the rights for the whole Marvel library for toys. That's unbelievable. Ike, who is an absolute genius businessman, but had no interest or affinity for comic books. The only thing he always understood instinctively is the value of a trademark. Ron Perlman had done a deal with Ike Perlmutter where he got 25% of ownership of, uh, of toy biz, but it had uh, uh, extra voting rights that were equivalent to about 76% or so. So basically, that gave toy biz an unlimited royalty-free free license to do Marvel action figures and toys, paying Marvel nothing. But in return, Perlman got controlling ownership. So it was a very sweet deal. Uh, they made toys and paid no licensing fee. So in order to protect that, they had to be the winners or else they would have lost their business. Keep in mind, while we're talking about a lot of money, this lot of money was chump change to Ron Perlman and even less money to Carl Icahn. At the time, Perlmutter uh, took over the company, uh, he had put all of his eggs in that basket. He had nowhere else to go if he didn't win the, the ownership. It became a David and Goliath because between Carl and, and Ron Perlman, there was power, a lot of power, a lot of influence in, on Wall Street. And we were like these two guys with an accent. It's different. Uh, was it a war? Yeah. So I suggested that it would be a good idea if all of the parties could get together and see if we could resolve this in some amicable way. So we had this meeting, which was very well attended by a great many lawyers, and all of the banks were at the meeting. And Mr. Icon came with some of his associates. And the meeting started off like most meetings, people express their opinions, and the sound volume began to rise. And then at some point in the meeting, the senior bank officer from J.P. Morgan got up and said, well, it's a very interesting discussion here, but I represent the banks, and we have $600 million 
at stake here, and I want to know how that's going to get paid. And Carl Icahn looked at him and said, who are you? And Mr. Repko explained who he was again, and uh, Mr. Icahn said, if I need comic relief, I'll turn on my TV set, which got Mr. Repko very upset. And Repko said, I don't have to put up with this. And he slammed down the lid on his attache case. And with that, the other six or seven banks did the same thing. And they all got up and walked out. So now we were left in a meeting without the banks. And the meeting broke up in disarray. And nothing was accomplished. Juin 1997, la justice approuve le plan de Carl Icahn et l'autorise à devenir actionnaire majoritaire des trois holdings administrant Marvel. Prochaine étape pour Icahn, contrôler la société opératrice Marvel Entertainment. Au bout de six mois de conflit, Ron Perelman réalise qu'il a plus à perdre qu'à gagner dans cette bataille et décide d'abandonner. Carl Icahn, qui n'a toujours pas remboursé les banques, estime désormais avoir tous les droits sur Marvel. When uh, Carl Icahn was taking over the company, he summoned us up to his office. Uh, he had about 150 of his closest advisors sitting around the table, as well as people standing around the walls. And I sat at the head of this conference table, a uh, uh, caddy corner with, uh, with Carl Icahn at the top. And we put our heads together, and I explained to him how comic books work. And we talked back and forth, buzz, 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 buzz. And uh, uh, that, that was uh, his introduction into what he had just taken over. Well, uh, listen, Carl is a businessman. It could have been a comic book company. It could have been a bra company. It could have been, uh, I don't know, a chair company. F for him, uh, part of the, 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 the ability of Carl Icahn, who is unfortunately very, very good in what he does, is that he doesn't fall in love with anything. I think if he looked at the comic book business and say, well, it's, it's really a suffering business, that he may have just closed it. I said, eh, we have the characters, we don't need the books. Yeah, you need the books because that's the Bible. It's the keepers of the flame. And you look at comic on 150,000 keeper of the flames, right? It was a time where Marvel had to be run by people who really cared about Marvel. Uh, it was more than a balance sheet. It was a culture. If Marvel had collapsed, the whole comic book industry would have collapsed. I controlled over somewhere between 30 and 36 percent of the comic book market at that time. And DC controlled probably about maybe 25 at that time. So if Marvel had collapsed, all the little comic book stores would have collapsed and the whole industry would have collapsed. So my job was to keep the comic books coming out. And there was all kind of lawyers and, and people fighting up in the clouds above us like Olympian gods. And they were spending, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars on lawyers. I think the estimate was like $40 million. dollars. Uh, on lawyers alone, uh, fighting over control and ownership of Marvel. Carl had a cash offer for the banks. Um, I believe that the bank probably wrote off the losses in Marvel. And they had a bank meeting, which was actually not legal. Literally, we had to run over to a law firm and more or less break down the door and say, no, you're not going to have this meeting without us. It became like one of these moments that I looked around the room and all these bankers basically in their minds were going to take the cash from Carl Icahn. And I said to them, you don't understand what you're doing. Spider-Man is worth a billion dollars. You're going to take 375 million for this company? One character, and I was wrong. Spider-Man is worth probably $10 billion, and it stopped everybody. I think the thing that made it work for us, that even the investment bankers and the bankers, there were a lot of young people there, you know, kids out of MBA schools, out of law schools, and many of these kids loved comics. And when you, when they hear Spider-Man is worth a billion, They got it. Convaincus par Avi Arad, les banquiers changent de camp. 
Le 31 juillet 1998, la Cour annule le précédent jugement favorable à Carl Icahn et valide le plan de Toy Biz pour fusionner avec Marvel. Vaincu, Icahn accepte une compensation financière pour se retirer. La procédure aura duré un an et demi. Very few people ever won against Carl Icahn. It's quite powerful. But this one, it's, it's like you cannot go to war without ideology. Soldiers without ideology cannot be a good soldier. I think, thank goodness, I had a partner like Ike. Not only he's tough, he's just so smart. How to deal with all these business issues. And our friendship was so strong that I, I, it wasn't even about just just the, the Marvel thing, it's just about the fact that I think I made him a believer that this thing is uh, very important. I'll never forget the first meeting with him over X-Men. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to make a show out of X-Men. What's X-Men? Uh, and, and it didn't matter. He said, you know what? You do your thing, I do my thing. That's why we were such amazing friends and partners. No one knew what to make of it when Avi and Perlmutter finally managed to wrest control. No one quite knew what was going to come of any of it. There was at least some sense that things had settled and a little bit of peace that came with that, but a lot of trepidation in the sense that we don't know what this means. And the last place you would imagine you would want to work is Marvel, but in a way it's actually quite exciting going into a place where there's nothing left to lose. As a creator, you know, as a writer, I love the idea of going in where anything goes. Like, uh, if you go into something that's very successful, it's kind of boring because people are scared to take risks. Whereas Marvel was at such an absolute nadir, things were just dreadful that they said, let's just try anything. And that's the kind of Wild West atmosphere that I quite enjoy. We wanted to resurrect some of our older, more tattered characters uh, for future use in movies. So uh, I talked with Joe Calamari and uh, uh, Joe suggested that uh, maybe we should do a deal with uh, Jimmy Palmiotti and Joe Casada. Joe and I would go to the cons with our own company event. We'd, we formed this small company. We put out a couple of titles like Ash and Painkiller Jane and 22 Brides, and we self-published it. They weren't great books, but they were fun books. And uh, them saying, we want to see what you guys would do with Marvel Comics if you had the chance. And for Joe and I, we sat there and said, oh my god, they're going to let us do anything we want? I put them up in the penthouse, which was a little office on roof level, well away from my comic book creators down on my floor, because there was a certain amount of resentment that I was giving away four characters to this new group to create under the name Marvel Knights a whole new line of comic books. Me and Joe were like, we have the whole penthouse? And again, we even had a separate, you had to go through a secretary to get up the stairs to go to the penthouse. And Joe and I, of course, we put TVs in there, we put a couch, we put drawing boards, and we worked up there the whole time. One of the characters we gave them was Daredevil. Daredevil had kind of faltered a bit. And so uh, Joe and Jimmy uh, went out and hired Kevin Smith, the director, uh, to uh, write the first eight issues of a new Daredevil line. The whole key to Marvel Knights was the right writer on the right character, the right artist on the right character. But the bigger issue for us was comics were always perceived as not cool, OK? So, you would never go in a bar and a girl goes, hi, what do you do for a living? You'd never say, oh, I make comic books. OK, that's, you might as well say, I'm a puppeteer. You know, the girl's just going to walk the other way. You know, it's just not, it was, wasn't cool. And we said, well, if we're two cool guys and we're doing this cool job, we have to convince everybody else it's a cool thing. So bringing in Kevin, we said, OK, well, this is a film guy who loves comics. And all of a sudden, Kevin's on talk shows going, yeah, I'm writing Daredevil. It's Marvel Night Books. It comes out in September. So all of a sudden, people who never even thought of looking at a comic were saying, well, Kevin Smith's writing it. Let me at least check it out. So our thing was to get it to a broader audience. And because of that cachet, we sold a lot of copies. And that brought Daredevil back to the forefront, where we were able to sell a Daredevil movie. 